Yeah. Am I good? All right. That's fine. All right, yeah. So about half the people in the room know me, and I'm really sorry I'm going to go through the whole who I am thing, but about half the people in the room don't know me, or if you do, I don't recognize you. So I'm going to go through all this, and you guys can just take a nap until then. So my name is Bill Semph. Uh, the at sign is because I hang out on Twitter a lot. If you're an anti-Twitter person, I apologize, but I kind of like microblogging because I can't think in more than 140 characters anyway. So um, my roles, I am a, I, I'm a husband. My wife is not here. Uh, I'm assuming she is wrangling children because I'm also a father of two children, uh, Adam, who I presented with last night actually for the first time about a game we developed jointly, and Kaylin, who's one and small and cute and apparently making friends all over the place. Um, I am a published author uh, in um, the world of software development, uh, which fits in here. I also call myself a software composer because I got sick of the architect tag. It's stupid. Uh, but that's actually, if you like, look at resumes, that's what I am. I'm, I'm the kind of guy that sits in between the business analyst and the developer team and figures out how to do all the stuff. You know, oh, we ought to put the data in the database and not store it in text files because that's bad. Stuff like that. That's, that's what I do for a living. Uh, and I, I'm an independent. Uh, Gabriel and I own our own company, and we just, I just bill hours to whoever feels like paying and having me around. Um, I got the term software composer from this book, which I strongly recommend everybody here read. It's actually a 136-page children's book about um, software engineering. And I learned more in those 136 pages than I have uh, with a bachelor's degree in software engineering and um, 20 years of industry experience. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable, and I, I recommend you get it. Um, plus, the author's a nice guy. It wasn't me. Um, <clears throat> I am a home brewer. I didn't bring any beer again. Uh, next year, we're going to implement, if, if I speak next year, uh, if they're nice enough to have me back, um, we will implement the Deviance U-Drink protocol, um, and I'll bring some homebrew, and we'll use that for that, and that'll be, that'll be a rockin' good time. Um, I am, in fact, a lock picker. Um, I am the administrative, uh, the, uh, what, what am I? The administrative director of Locksport International. Um, I'm um, also involved in the Columbus chapter, the president of whom, John Snyder, is sitting in the front row here. Uh, so if he and I sit and make funny comments, that's why, it's because we run that group and it's fun. Um, I am a ninja. Uh, I'm, I'm actually fifth Q, but don't attack me because I'm fat and out of shape. Um, and I'm also occasionally uh, been labeled an insurrectionist because I have this really bad habit of saying stupid things at the wrong time. So those are all the things that I am. Uh, I'd love to hear what all of you are, but there's a, quite a few of you, so that'll take too long. Let's instead talk about how I got here, because that's vaguely interesting. Um, so I learned to pick locks at DEF CON 15, which really wasn't that long ago, considering how much of an impact this made on my life. You'll see that over the next thing. So about five years ago, um, I learned how to pick. I learned from Deviant Olam, who's here, uh, though not in the room, I don't think, um, and who is an excellent uh, lock picking teacher. Uh, and it's kind of funny because the, the way I got into it, I didn't go to DEF CON 15 to learn to lock pick. I went to DEF CON 15 to learn about network security because I have always kind of had one foot in the systems administration and one foot in the software development line because, frankly, when you're a software architect, enterprise architect, you have to. Um, you need to know how the systems work. So I've kind of kept a foot in both camps. And security, uh, even back then, certainly now, much bigger topic than it had been when I had started in the industry. So I had been um, trying to keep up, and a trip to DEF CON was in the cards. Gabrielle was with me. This was pre-kids. Um, Gabrielle was with me, and no, it wasn't pre-kids. My parents kept at them. Um, and she was just like wandering around doing legal and privacy stuff. She's an accountant by trade. And um, so I'm in the middle of some session, and she calls my cell phone. Pick it up. What, what's going on? I'm in the middle of the session. She goes, you have got to come up here. They're teaching us to pick locks. I was like, no, not, no, you've got to come up. So I go up, and I go, I've, anybody ever been to DEF CON in the Lockport, Locksport Village? Oh, good, so you know what I mean. It's this tiny room filled with sweaty teenage bodies. It's miserable. And then there's this long table with one of the hotel white tablecloths on it, and D.V. and Olam sitting on the other side of it. And Gabrielle is this blonde chick is sitting directly across from him, um, completely surrounded by these sweaty white teenage boys. Um, and it's, it was quite a, quite a view. But she had been there for four hours, and he had just been teaching her steadily more and more and more. And there was a, pair, a bottle of Jack Daniels sitting next to them that apparently had been purchased new by her in order to keep him sitting there, which was now half empty. So that was my introduction to the Big King. Uh, and since then, I've learned that it actually gets worse. Um, oops. So I came back to Columbus, and um, the martial art I studied, ninjutsu, um, 
it has a stealth entering component to it. So I thought, wow, it'd be kind of cool to learn how locks work and don't work. So I'll teach my martial arts group. And we started getting together every couple months and picking locks for fun and learning new stuff and got in touch with, with LI and Columbus LI was born. Um, I then met Doug Farr, who's the president of Locksport International at DEF CON 17. And he, um, in a drunken stupor, um, promoted me to the administrative director of LI, which basically means Doug's bitch. Um, anything that he doesn't feel like doing, I get to do. And that's worked out okay, I guess, in the long haul. Anyway, um, so after that, we, um, I, I did something relatively smart, which is unusual for me. Um, we started out with about 12 guys in the lockpicking group. We just met at my house, which is a, a nice big house. Um, but it, when it got to 20 and then 25 and then 30, it got a little too big for my house. And we ended up like sitting on the deck and going down. It was, it was a mess. So I started looking for a hacker space. Well, there isn't really a network style hacking space in Columbus. Um, but there is the Columbus Idea Foundry, which is a maker alliance, very similar to Maker Fair, Maker Fair Cleveland? No, it's not Maker Fair, it's Maker something. Maker Alliance in Cleveland. Um, it's the same thing, 26,000 square foot of cool tools that you couldn't afford and couldn't fit in your basement, you could. Um, and I went to Alex Bandar, who runs that, and said, hey, listen, I've got this group of lock pickers. I'd love to meet at your shop, how much? And he said, I'll tell you what, if you teach a lock picking class, here, because that's what they do most of these, teach classes and their stuff, I will give you the space for free. And I went, oh, well, that works fine for me. So <clears throat> we ended up moving there. Everything worked wonderfully. Um, and um, over time, John took over the group. Um, and we're still meeting at the Idea Foundry. And I'm still teaching there. And that's kind of where the basis of this talk comes from. Um, <clears throat> because what I'm doing now is, like I said, I'm teaching normal humans about once a month, sometimes twice a month, um, a lock picking course, more or less using Deviant Olam well tools, basic slide deck. For those of you who are familiar with lock sport or lock picking or, or may have gone to one of the physical security seminars that say Derby Con or, or DEF Con or something like that, you've probably seen the deck. Uh, it's been kind of a collaboratively edited deck that's been floating around for probably seven years now. Um, of uh, just basic picking with some really nice animations that people have put together over time and just gather together. Scholar Towns had a piece in it, Deviants had a piece in it, I've had a piece in it. There's all these little things that have gone in. Now it's like 290 slides long. Um, and that's basically what I teach from is that deck, just more or less using it as a textbook. But I'm teaching normal people. Frankly, mostly it's artists, makers, you know, engineer type people the, 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 that, that tend to go to those maker alliances. And, um, that is what I have been doing. I have also been doing um, the Columbus branch of LI. Um, John runs it. I help because I got a lot of the stuff together. And we've been doing all kinds of stuff. We, we use, uh, as all the LI chapters do, we use meetup.com so people know what's coming up. We pre-schedule our uh, topics. Um, last month I wasn't there, but you did pick making or security pins? Pick making last month. The, the Wednesday we have a meeting actually, and we're talking about repinnable locks. Um, and as we just get together a couple little things and do a little bit of a presentation, and then we sit around and pick locks and drink beer for a couple hours. It's a good time. Um, and that's, there's John's back. Nice of me to show your best feature there. Your, your, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so what else am I doing? I'm still the administrative director of LI. Ostensibly that means I'm in charge of um, managing membership. So if a chapter, once somebody contacts LI and wants to get a chapter started, I talk to them about what it means to have a chapter started, help them get organized, get their gear together, get started, find a place, um, and, uh, and get members in. Um, so since I started, and this isn't because of me, this is just the, to give you an idea of the work that I've done, um, we went from like five chapters to now I think 13, including one in Singapore, which I'm trying to get like LI to fund a, you know, emergency trip out there to help them or something, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so that's been an interesting thing. Um, some of the real luminaries of, uh, of Locksport are involved. Um, the guy who runs Serapic, whose name I've forgotten, is one of the board members in LI. John King, who, who created, built the Metacoder, he's, he's one of the board members of LI. It's, I'm, I'm honored by the company. Anyway, um, I'm also, in, um, mostly through the Foundry, but other stuff, and, and with John, John too, taking Locksport Villages out to the people, very similar to the one that we have here. We take our gear, we go, we just teach people in the public about locks and Locksport and the fact that this is really a hobby and we're not just a bunch of thieves. Um, for instance, here's a picture of me teaching at um, 
the, wow, the woodworking show. Now, the reason why I was at a woodworking show of all places was because the Idea Foundry was in invited because they do a lot of woodworking at the Idea Foundry. They're a maker alliance. Um, the reason why I was there, um, well, the reason why I was there was because John just has wisdom teeth out. But the reason why Locksport International was there was because the, um, the guy who runs the woodworking show says, yeah, our membership, they're kind of tired of woodworking. So we'd like to have some other stuff there. But this is the woodwork. Anyway, so. Um, it's really interesting to teach, you know, 90-year-old guys that have been working in the craft for their entire lives how to pick a lock. That's, that's, that was a treat. And, yes, of course, I'm a pick pusher uh, as far as the, the last of things that I'm up to. Um, I uh, am, as, as with most people in, in lock sport, fund most of the activities, buy locks and beer and such like that, by selling picks to people who learn from us. Um, and so that always leads to the inevitable question of, are these things legal? And stuff like that. So all of this stuff comes together um, to well, all of these, these, these things I've been involved with over the past five years kind of come together to show me um, a, a, some really worthwhile topics um, that I actually wouldn't mind dis just discussing in general. We have a small enough crowd here about what kind of things you can learn about the public viewpoint of security by using Locksport as kind of a gateway drug. And, and that's where I've been kind of thinking for the last 18 months or so is judging people's reactions to certain things and trying to break down a couple of key points about how people view security, how people view information security and physical security, um, because I, I get to feed them things like, you're not as secure as you think. This lock is basically a do not disturb sign. People who want to get through a lock will. Um, they can do it without you knowing. And even if they don't care about that, you realize that a crowbar will open this. Or that fancy lock on your front door doesn't do you any good if you've got a window next to it. Um, so the, the, the responses that I get from people have kind of driven me to create this list of things that I've, I've, I've maybe gleaned from the experience and I wanted to share them and then get some feedback. So with, let's, let's do that. Um, the first most important thing is that people are actually interested in security, not just lock picking. They're actually interested in security. They're interested in the psychology of security and they're interested in the physical technique of security. Um, I've, been, I've taught, I think, about 30 lock picking classes at the Foundry and I cap them at 10 so that I can keep um, uh, hands on experience with these people. And I have, ne I have never had one yet fail to sell out. Um, they all sell out within a couple days of going up on the website, not because I'm an awesome teacher, trust me, but because people are genuinely interested. Wow, lockpicking, huh? Um, and yes, okay, part of it is the draw um, of what lock sport, what, what the, the thought of picking a lock is. I mean, let's, let's face it, part, probably the reason we're all in the room is that everybody's had that on their bucket list. I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's one of those things you just want to know how to do. But also, once they get in there and they, they realize that it isn't just, okay, let's pick a lock, let's talk about security in general and how to be more secure and how to understand what different kinds of security are. If you've seen the presentation, you know there's handcuffs in there, there's forensics in there, there's all kinds of things in there. You find out that there is a genuine interest in security. Once the picking is learned, there are many questions just generally on the topic of security. Amongst some of our groups, we get in very complex discussions about what it means to actually be secure versus um, just being private, for instance. It's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's something that I've drawn out of that, that, that we've taken, a, like I said, just a generic group of people, and we have um, uh, found out that they are honestly interested in and would like to learn more about security. Um, Locksport is actually a pretty decent analog to information security as well. Um, the, 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 you think about keeping people out of things. I mean, that's what a lot of information security is. And even if they get in, you want to know how they got in, when they got in, and who they were. And learning about locks actually is real similar to that topic you get a lot of, um, uh, you, you're, you're basically trying to keep people out of things. There are levels of security. And you want the system to be such that if somebody gets in, you can tell that they got in so that you can respond effectively. 
So teaching people Locksport is actually an effective way to migrate their thinking into other kinds of information security talk. Now, I haven't done this in the classroom yet, but I've done it a lot just personally with people, um, the people that I teach um, who are already InfoSec people and that I teach Locksport to, or lockpicking in general. Um, I will take them and say, okay, so let's, 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 let's figure out what we, um, where the merges are between what we're doing here and what you're doing in information security. And one of the key things is the, the, that assignment of risk and, and, um, versus cost or versus difficulty. For instance, you can put many different levels of padlock on your shed, right? But there comes a point when it's, the lock is so expensive or so difficult to maintain that it's worth more in either time or money than what's inside the shed. So do most of us put, you know, these, uh, you know, some big fancy Sergeant Greenleaf lock on our shed? No, because honestly, if somebody steals our lawnmower, we're only out 80 bucks anyway, and we don't care. So th that kind of assignment also appeals on the infosec side, which is a, which is an interesting discussion in and of itself. So, you know, segueing from that, that concept of levels of security is initially foreign to most. Most people in the lock picking classes, in general, think that there is a lock and it has a key, and that's it. There aren't more secure locks. It's either locked or it's not locked, which is actually has another, has also another very similar analog to InfoSec. A lot of people think it either has a password or it doesn't, not realizing there's actually many different levels of security. So when we're put in a position where it's like, okay, let's, the, the, the key is the, the key example is the, um, the progressive set. Um, if, if, if you guys have learned to pick, um, you, often are taught um, using a progressively pinned set of locks. So you get a lock with one pin in it, and you pick the one pin just to get a feel of what the pick is like. Then you pick a lock with two pins to get a feel for what binding feels like, because with one pin it never really binds, or you don't get to feel anything but binding. So with two pins you get to feel springy in the binding and then pick them in order. And then three pins, okay, let's just make it a little bit more difficult, more difficult. And by the end of it they're going, so if you want like a really hard lock to pick it, it'd be really long and have 26 pins in it? Well, no, there's other things you do to make the lock more secure. Okay, wait a minute, more secure. So you're gonna, you, you actually have different qualities of security. Wouldn't you just want it to always be the most secure? Well, no, because they're extremely difficult to machine and maintain and so you get into that discussion. Um, that idea is pretty foreign to most people. They think they have a lock on their front door and their door is locked and that is that. It's, it's really coming from somebody who's, studied security for a long time and been professionally involved for a couple of years now, that was a shocking uh, discovery for me, is to find out that a lot of people felt that way. Um, <clears throat> segueing from that, um, you discovered that risk is deemed accept uh, acceptable to most people. There is the, the concept of, well, once they, once they learn that there's different levels of lock, they say, well, Bill, what do you have on your front door? And I say, well, I'm a geek. I have a, I have a buy lock on my front door, um, but it's not because nobody can pick it. Though nobody can pick it, uh, if you're not familiar, buy lock's an Australian company. That's um, it's a U-shaped key. I have the key. If you want to see it afterwards, there's a U-shaped key, and there's two rows of pin, two rows of seven pins. So it's a 14-pin lock, um, and it is it is extremely difficult. Actually, I don't think anyone's actually picked one that's whole, um, though that may not be true anymore. But that's neither here nor there. I have a six-foot window next to my door. Okay, and then I have my front is all done with rocks. So if you wanted in, you could get in. It's, that, that's not the point. The point is, is that I think locks are cool and that's why I have it on my front door. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the point that I wanna, I wanna make uh, with, with this though, with them when they ask that is, I, I say, I understand that somebody could get in if they wanted to get in. And the response is pretty much always, yeah, but that doesn't, that doesn't really happen. I mean, it, 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 it does, but it doesn't, I mean, you know, nobody really worries about that, right? I mean, why would they put, why would the people that built the house put the, these cheap locks on if, it, if people actually, you know, broke them? You know what I mean? Okay, yes, I, I sort of do know what you mean. Where they're getting to is that the risk is deemed ex acceptable. Rather than having to deal with the concept of making their facility more secure, they'd rather look and say, you know what, this isn't very likely. And leave it at that, which is well, a, little, a little scary. Um, on that exact topic, uh, we, we, we look at people, even if the risk is unacceptable, are often very unwilling to change. 
knowing that they are in a position where increased security may actually help them. The, the core example is gun locks, in my opinion. We, uh, we, we don't have any gun locks in the Columbus LI um, collection, and we need to. But I've worked with them when I've been like sitting in on other people's Lockport lock, lock, lock villages and have shown people how easy they are to open. And generally it's, you know, well, yeah, but my, my son would never figure out how to pick that open. When his son's sitting next to him picking a schlag open, like, yeah, yes, he, he could if you wanted to. I mean, if that's your point, is to use the gun lock to protect, to, to separate your children, potentially, or your children's friends from this lock, from this gun, you have to understand that lock isn't going to solve the problem. You have to find something else. And people go, yeah, maybe, but they, they, they don't. And they don't. I mean, we've had the discussion in, the, in, the, in the, both the Locksport group and um, in my classes. And in general, even people who know how ineffective a gun, a gun locks are, don't change it because eh, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. They're lazy. People are lazy, which I think as information security professionals, we've all discovered that pretty much, haven't we? I mean, I assume most of you in here are InfoSec people. We've discovered that people are unwilling to change things, even if it means you're changing a password. Um, so this is something that we already knew uh, that, that I think is an interesting topic with this, that there is a, something of a mystique about hackers. And um, we already kind of all knew this because it's probably why most of us ended up in the field. Very few of us stumbled into it. Probably most of us watched, you know, war games. If you're as old as me or one of the later versions, I'm sure some of the kids here, could, what's, what, you're younger than me. What's, a, what's your version of war game? Hackers, okay, yeah, it's exactly like that. And went, wow, that is cooler than shit. I'm going to go break into my computer. And that's what they do. Um, but th there is, and we all know that there's the majority of people out there have no idea what any of us do. Um, and that fits into the physical realm too. Um, I have had more people contact me afterwards when I refer them to Johnny Long's book, No Tech Hacking. Uh, if you have not read that book, you should. I should have a picture of that actually for this presentation too. Um, Johnny Long, No Tech Hacking. It's a Singress book? No, it doesn't matter. Just look up No Tech Hacking. You'll find it. Uh, it's basically an entire book full of more or less physical hacks. Okay, some of it's like Google hacking, you know, and, and, or, or Google, uh, fancy Google searches and stuff like that. But it also he talks about the, the, the doors that have the um, motion sensor on the back and you take a, a, a wet paper towel and a, a clothes hanger and go like this and the door comes open. Those, those kinds of things. Uh, I refer a lot of people in my classes to that book. And Almost everybody who has seriously, I mean, been seriously interested, like ordered it on their phone while they're sitting there, has contacted me a couple weeks later and said, that book changed the way I look at everything. So it's, it's, it's been um, worthwhile for me to introduce the masses to that mid-level of hacking that Locksport fits into, this, this kind of physical, you don't need to know how to run Nmap sort of thing um, uh, around hackers. That's, that's, been, that's, that's entertaining. Um, so on the, on the exact flip side of that, this idea of security theater uh, makes a lot of sense to people. Even though, in general, people are, uh, as we've discussed, kind of dismissive of these levels of security, um, <clears throat> when they're talking about other people, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they, they, they recognize the whole, the whole, you know, oh, yeah, those people are sheeple. They, they need to be lulled into, uh, lulled into obedience, lulled into a false sense of security. The TSA is a, is a constant topic. Oh, boy. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> a constant topic <clears throat> in my classes. Um, because there's the whole TSA locks thing. <clears throat> and I do, uh, I talk about, um, uh, for, for those of you who have heard Deviant's talks on physical security, you might have heard him uh, talk about this. Um, traveling with firearms just so you can lock your, your bags. So I see a couple of nods, but I'll tell the story anyway. Um, the... Um, if you travel with a firearm on the airlines in the United States, you must put the firearm in a hard, locked container that only you maintain the key to. Okay? So a lot of people will put it in a gun box and then put that in their suitcase. Well, Deviant and myself and now many, many others don't do that. I, I, carry a, I have a Pelican case that is my suitcase, and the gun is just in foam in there. And I go to the, go to the, to the front and say, I'm traveling with firearms today. I'm open the whole thing. Then I put two Alloy 25s on the outside. It's just, this, this, bleh, this container locks. Not really pickable. Um, so if somebody wanted in my bags, they would, uh, I would know because they would have to cut the locks off. 
that's the only way they would be able to get in. <clears throat> but the the discussion with people about that leads to this whole yeah TSA they're just they're just putting on a show to make people less intelligent than those of us sitting here feel safe. And it's interesting that with all the problems surrounding security, that that idea still comes into play with, uh, with, with the people that I've been teaching Luxport to. I, it's it's one, of the, um, one of the mysteries of all of this, as it were. <clears throat> so this is another uh, statement that I think anybody who's been working in InfoSec for any length of time would, would agree with. Um, it's very much true that people don't trust what they don't understand. As it turns out, doing security right, whether it be InfoSec or physical security, is hard. It's hard. There's a lot of stuff you have to think about, a lot of really evil things you have to consider. You have to consider people wanting to do bad things to you, which is not the kind of thing people want to do. They don't understand why people would behave that way. And so they just don't think about it. They don't, they don't consider it. They don't like to have to do actions based on those types of thoughts. And I don't know, I, I, find, that, uh, I find that fascinating. Um, even though the, the statement itself is, um, is pretty obvious. So <clears throat> there is also this general consensus, and this goes back to the, very much back to the InfoSec world as well, is that security makes things harder to do. So let's step back for a second to the traveling with firearms example. Um, the question I get every single time when I tell that story in lock picking classes is, but isn't that a lot of trouble? You have to go get your hand, bags manually. Thing you get, you you you're you're stepping out of the normal line of things. Isn't that a pain? Aren't you making your life more difficult? You know, well, yeah, I'm trading a little bit of convenience in exchange for, you know, not letting some, you know, teenage minimum wage worker dig through my bag whenever they want to. I think that's a fair trade, don't you? Um, but the the answer is pretty much no. Going back to you know, people, people being people being lazy and, and rejecting change, um, th they just view much of that next tier of security as an inconvenience. That I think is something that we as a community need to start getting rid of. And I'll, I'll talk about education later, but in, in, in the conclusions. But th I can I can say it now. Definitely, and, and, and this story is I, told so often in infosec conferences that I don't even feel good saying it again, but it's true. User education has to be our number one goal. Whether we're teaching people about lock sport and trying to make it not watered down milk toast, but not elite. Leave it at the level where people are challenged but understand in order to raise the bar for everyone. That needs to happen in InfoSec as well. And me being in, you know, in, involved in security, software security now for several years, I'm, I'm recognized that that analog between the Locksport world and the InfoSec world is very, very tight. Um, and we've got to be really, really careful about how we go about teaching this. And I don't have the answers. I'm the first to say it. But there are people out there who do. And those of us who are just of the attitude that, oh, users are losers, they're just there to make my life difficult, need to change that attitude and go about teaching people and helping gently sway their attitudes into a philosophy of, hey, okay, this is a little bit more inconvenient, but boy, it's a hell of a lot better in the long run. Um, <clears throat> so we, we talk, you know, we, we call ourselves hackers in the information security industry a lot of times. And what we mean by that, and often we'll strenuously tell people, is that hackers are creative problem solvers. And that is extremely true. I mean, you, you look at the people that are at this con, for crying out loud. It, it's a bunch of people who really have these, uh, these remarkable abilities to look at a problem and think at it from many different angles, you know, come up with an orthogonal solution that solves the problem and solves other things at the same time. It blows me away. I'm actually not that terribly good at that. I am not a particularly good out-of-the-box thinker. I'm not a particularly good hacker. Um, I'm just a good organizer of ideas, which is why these people let me come to these conferences and talk to you all. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually one of the people that thinks that out-of-the-box thinking is hard. But um, you, as a group, need to remember how hard it is because you've all forgotten because you do it every day. But for us plebs, it's, it's rough. 
And you go, oh, yeah, we'll just do this and this and this. It's like, oh, man. I mean, uh, like, um, I, I, tell, I will tell people all the time, um, like in airports, I will remind people, hey, you might want to sit your, with your back to a wall because you're surfing your bank's website, and there's nine people standing behind you looking. And they're like, what are you talking about? I mean, the concept that they might be shoulder surfed is a revelation to many people. And, and th that's just day-to-day -day operation for InfoSec people. <laughs> that's how you get your information to, to, to do pen testing and such, or, or, or problem solving in general. So anyway, that, that's, that's just a, 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 um, an, interesting, um, an interesting topic right there. Um, on the other hand from that, though, um, not, everyone is, um, not everyone is actually dense about that. And it makes our job that much more difficult. Um, oftentimes, when I, uh, when I give software pr presentations about computer software, uh, which I do a lot, I am not God's gift to programming at all. I'm, like I said before, I'm just a good organizer of ideas. I, I spend most of my time up here thinking, those of you who have given presentations know how this works. You've got one mechanical side of your brain that's giving the presentation, and then there's a little voice in the back of your head going, your fly's undone, or whatever. Um, and that little voice in the back of my head when I'm doing software presentations is, these people don't care. They don't care. Because you can see that one guy sitting you know, in the middle of the sixth row or whatever who's falling asleep, and you're thinking, you know, that guy just gave a presentation on like the 300 level of this topic in the other room. Why is he in here? And you feel, ah, I really need to you know, up the game of the presentation for that guy. But see, that's not really true. But that mixed level of philosophies about security makes our job much more difficult than the InfoSec world. Because some people are too concerned about security. They're so focused on it, they want to you know, make it more difficult for other people to keep the riffraff out. And the point is, is the riffraff have to be able to use the system. We can't lock them out. They, they need to be able to use it. So our message needs to be tailored for a very broad stretch. And that's extremely tough, but I think it's a challenge we're all up to. Um, <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me do this here for a second so my voice doesn't get bad. So, if you watch the news, it seems like everybody's been robbed and beaten, right? But if you live your life, it, it, it's often, I mean, I'm, 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 I don't want to start storytelling on this level, but it often happens that you get a group like this together and nobody even knows anyone who's ever had a, a significant security problem. It's actually not that common. In a, I mean, any kind of security. We're all in the infosec business, and we and, and we know how the these automated bots are taking over machines and stuff like that, and that's changing the face of the industry compared to actual people breaking in. Um, so, so that's a little it's a little different because we're we're, we're facing a, a faceless, nameless opponent almost in, in the infosec world. But in the physical security world, you you can have this you have a big family or a big friend base, and actually know absolutely no one who's ever had a physical security problem. Um, so that kind of clouds the perception of what risk is. And honestly, it does for me too. This is something I struggle with a lot. When people ask me, you know, well, why do you, if you know that the locks can be picked, why do you bother putting locks on it at all? Because if somebody's going to get into your door, they're going to get in whether they want to or whether you want them to or not. The locks might just be an inconvenience. And even though that's heresy to say in a group like this or in a lock picking group, actually there's kind of a grain of truth to that. Because really, if somebody wanted in, they're going to get in anyway. And if they're nice enough to not try to not pick the lock, they're not going to try the door at all. And that's a pretty good point. I, I, okay, so I'll tell you a little story. I don't teach picking ace locks, okay? Um, initially, it was because I didn't have the, the tool. Even though you can pick it with a hook, it's hard. It's better to have an ace tool uh, to pick it. An ace lock, I'm sorry, it's a circular, like, star-shaped lock. You find it on uh, vending machines. And that's the second reason I don't teach it. It's just... It's just too convenient. It's too easy um, to be in, the, in a, a deserted part of the hotel and go, and I mean, they're really easy to pick if you have the tool. Open the lock, take the change, put it in your pocket, put it, close, oops, sorry, close the thing and leave. I think that's just too, that's too easy. I mean, honestly, the people that we teach to, to pick like deadbolts, they're not likely to break into people's front doors. It's much easier to kick in the back door than it is to pick the front door. Uh, and I know that it's so much easier that 
it's not even, it doesn't even really enter into conversation. Those of you who were at my talk last year, um, we, we, we discussed that at that time. But I have this thing in my head that ace locks and, and the, the, the temptation of, um, of uh, uh, soda machines and stuff, vending machines, is too great. But somebody in one of my classes said, I was, I was teaching how to pick a wafer lock. And if, if, if people picked wafer locks in this room? Yeah, they're, they are the classic do not disturb sign. They are so easy to open. I have a video of myself opening one by accident just trying to get the pick in the lock. All right, it's, it's ridiculous. So somebody, I was flipping through Deviant Slides and saying, yeah, these locks are really weak, but look at all the important things they're used for. And um, this, this girl was, was in my class and said, um, these are used for file cabinets. I went, yeah. She goes, well, what about like HR records and stuff like that? I said, you're right. Yeah, you know, think about stuff like that. She's like, man, that's, I mean, this is really easy. Is, is, is this really common knowledge? And I said, a normal pat line. Well, it's not really common knowledge because a lot of people don't know you can pick locks. But those people who know that locks are pickable know where to get the information. So it's, it's, it's literally security by obscurity. There's a whole group of people out there who don't think that you can pick a lock. Um, but the group, that, that smaller percentage who do, they know where they can get the information. And she says, because, you know, you're, you're showing people how to do this. I can see, I mean, that's pretty low barrier to entry to just, pop open the HR files at work and take a look at somebody's pay grade. And I went, wow, that's actually easier and less chance, or less risk of getting caught than the, a, than the ace lock and the soda machine thing. What am I doing here? Um, so th that's, I'm, 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 I, I went off a bit of a tangent with that, but the, 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 uh, the, the end game to this is that we've got to, kind of ask ourselves oh, what level we're going to teach and how we're going to broach these topics to the users that are using it and then the people who need to administer it. It's, it's, it's a tough topic. I don't pretend to have the answers, but it, it's worth bringing up. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I kind of covered this in the last slide by accident, but we, we, we have a problem with the media, both internal to our industry and external to the world when you're talking about the lockpicking world. Um, there, there is... Um, the, the, nothing worse than your local news station getting a fire and brimstone end of the world is nigh kind of security person to talk about lock picking. I don't know if you've ever had that happen in your city, but um, the, 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 the bump locks thing was the one that happened in Columbus. And uh, I guess Channel 10 did a thing on it. And it became like all this stuff. And they interviewed, you know, the, the manager at Lowe's to say, why are you selling these locks if they're so easily bumpable? And the guy's like, uh. It's, 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 I don't know. <clears throat> so, and, that, and that's a, a danger within our industry, too, because we have a habit of only watching news uh, or reading uh, about the bad things that happen. And, it, and it, it, we have this clouded perception as to what reality is actually like out there. Um, the fact is, is that Anonymous isn't hacking into most of our systems. We're, like I said, we're facing this nameless, faceless threat of these automated hacking systems. And that's kind of where our focus should be. But instead, our focus is on the much sexier world of the, the advanced persistent threats and, and stuff like that. So maybe, maybe there's some adjustment in, in focus that has to occur in the, Locksport, or in the InfoSec world, just like it has to occur in the Locksport world. Um, so what, what, this, what, this all, what this all boils down to is um, there's a lot of tough questions. Uh, a lot of tough questions that I don't have really uh, fantastic answers to, um, but that figuring out what does and doesn't work as far as both security itself and also educating users is really quite tough. Um, and I don't think anyone has effectively answered either of those questions yet. Um, I would put it to the InfoSec community, those people who are sitting quietly doing their jobs well, that you need to take a step and join the, co the group conversation that's out there because a lot of the discussion out there in many of the podcasts and in many of the blogs is of that fire and brimstone type or of the yeah, users or losers type. Those of us who are actually going out and doing good security need to open our mouths and join the conversation or turn on your speakers and join the... Uh, um, so... I touched on this. Uh, I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, that that it's this this fact um, makes it doing that much more demanding because we are talking, and I, I like I said before, to this huge breadth of people, some of whom 
legitimately get it and don't need to be told again, some of whom are over the top, ridiculous, um, have, have, a, have, a, have a draconian view of the world of security, and some people who are genuinely clueless, not in that, you know, please teach me kind of way, but in that, ah, nothing's going to happen to me, leave me alone, you're making my life more difficult kind of way. Finding a message that's suited to all of those is something that the whole community has to work at. It's true in the Locksport community, and it's true in the InfoSec community. Um, so overall, um, it, it, my, my, my thoughts are that uh, most of what it, the InfoSec thinks about, InfoSec community thinks about public perception of, of, of security appears to pretty much be true. A, a lot of the things that I've said here probably weren't very much of a surprise. You probably maybe hadn't phrased them in the same way or hadn't thought about them from the same angle, but probably a lot of you had already thought some of these things before. <clears throat> but what, what we need to take from this is that it's not just an InfoSec problem. I've kind of come about this from the halfway point because me not being a, a, an actual um, security professional, I'm, I'm a software developer who happens to write a lot, the right security layer of a lot of pieces of software. I don't interact with people very much. So the discovery that this world of, of physical security and by teaching Locksport had all these analogs in the InfoSec world was kind of a, a revelation to me. And it should be kind of a call to arms to you to realize that it's, it's not, it's not a, a, a pinpoint problem. It isn't your company. It isn't your company's culture. It isn't your user group's culture. It is maybe a global culture. And we need to take a few steps and see if we can broaden, uh, broaden awareness um, and broaden the pool of people who are providing the content. Uh, and then the third thing that I, I really take out of this is that Locksport is an awesome gateway drug to understanding security. And I think that um, if, if you uh, know how to pick and you have access to some resources or you have a Locksport community in your town, like the, the Cleveland Locksport group or co in Columbus, you could you come talk to, to John and I for LI. There's a group in Cleveland, there's a group in Dayton. I'm sorry, there's a group in Cincinnati, there's a group in Dayton. Um, if outside, there's, there's many other groups as well. Um, bringing them in, doing a lunch and learn with your company about lock picking is an awesome way to start the conversation about security in general. And you may learn some of the things that I learned that we've talked about here today. And, and be able to turn the conversation to, hey, look, th there's some analogs here to the kinds of things we're facing with our network, with our, with our business in general. Let's, let's talk about what that means now that you've, now that you've experienced some of the reality of, of physical security. Um, so that's me. Um, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. I don't know how, I'm kind of running a little long time, so um, we might have to wander off elsewhere. 15, so give or take. Uh, somewhere in there. Uh, if you have any questions for the group, that's fine. Um, or you can grab me on Twitter or LinkedIn or send me an email. I'm really easy to find because of the, the whole authoring thing. Um, uh, or if you've got some things you want to talk about here, you can feel free to pipe up right now. Or you can sit and stare at me. Oh, yeah. We, uh, started off there, Nick. That's good. That is an awesome question. I do not pretend to have the answer to that. Um, <clears throat> I am literally here to bring up the point that I've observed it. I don't, I, I, I don't have the answers. That would be a fantastic talk for you to give next year. Seriously, that sounds terrible, but, but you, you, you're, you're one of those people. I mean, you're, you do the podcasting thing, and you have the right message, so you're, not, you're, you're, you're on the good, good guys team for sure. But there are, oh, let's see here. That, that decision needs to be made as a team. We've got to have these discussions and figure out how we teach the users about the, about the philosophy of security to understand why not to hold the door for people who don't have their badge evidence, to understand why when the guy calls and says, 
hey, uh, you know, I'm, 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 you know, trying to sort out the phone system. Can you read me these numbers off the bottom of your phone? Why they should maybe think twice before doing that. Explaining not just to do it, you know, if, if that happens, call me. But explaining why. C creating that message is going to be something we're all going to have to work on. And I, I'm, I'm not up here saying, hey, here's how we should do this, because I don't know. But I know it needs to be done, and it's not being done. I mean, the, the, we, you, there's probably been a number of talks here today um, where, where the, some luminary in the InfoSec community stand up and says, we're losing. This shows we're losing. As an as a InfoSec community, we're losing the battle. And, but it's, God, it's true. We are. We're losing. In, in so many ways, we're losing. I mean, we're, we're, we're not gathering, per your talk, we're not gathering effective enough data to, um, to, to fight the, the, the automated security scare, and we're losing the social engineering battle because we're not educating the users effectively. And um, I, I can't do the, well, I, I, I can't. The, the, the first one isn't the subject of this talk, but the second one, we need to craft that message as a group. I mean, together, over beer, preferably. I think. So I'm sorry I don't have an answer for you, but, but I'm hoping you have an answer for me, maybe. You know what I mean? Not, not you by yourself, but... Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But the, 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 either way, I mean, the, the, all of us, all of us in this room, all of us at this con um, need, to, need to continue working together, not just to get that cool new Ode, but, but to, um, to craft a message to explain to a user why that cool new Ode is important and what it means to them and, and why having a bunch of stuff installed in their computer makes it much more likely that that next cool, cool new Ode is going to you know, make them have to reformat their box or lose their information. Nobody else, really? I was, I was that boring, huh? You guys are like all phased out. I guess it is Friday or Saturday at 5. Everybody's probably either hungover or waiting for their next drink. That's a possibility, too. All right, well, you know how to reach me. Um, I'd love to have the conversation. Um, I'll be around, and thank you all very much. Uh, have a good rest of the con. Hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. Thank you.